armor and kingship is in his grasp in power and dominion. On this Feast of the Epiphany, let us join together in singing hymn number 109, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace of our newborn Savior be with all of you. Amen. First, uh, thank you to our confirmation class for hosting our celebration of the liturgy today and for taking part in all of the particular roles that we have. I think Gabe is the only one that's not part of the confirmation class, unless you're a secret member. Right? No, oh, okay. Today is the Epiphany, the Feast of the Epiphany. And the word Epiphany means a manifestation, a revelation. And the idea is that today the three kings come to Bethlehem, as we see in our crib today, and they uh, come to adore and worship the Lord. They are not of the Jewish race. They are what are called Gentiles. Anyone who is not Jewish is a Gentile. So this is a manifestation, a revelation to the whole world that Christ is our Savior, Christ is our King. So as we begin our celebration on this Feast of the Epiphany, let us ask the mercy of the Lord to help us to refrain from any bias or prejudice or rejection of anyone, that we may live with the manifestation of God's great love for all people. Oh. 
God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good will. Glory to God in the highest, and on to people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory, Lord God, heavenly King, O oh God, almighty Father. We to the Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father. You take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you are alone, are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who on this day revealed your only begotten Son to all the nations by the guidance of a star, grant in your mercy that we who know you already by faith may be brought to behold the beauty of your sublime glory. We pray through our Lord Jesus, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Good morning. Good morning. Today's reading is from the book of Isaiah. Rise up in splendor, Jerusalem. Your time has come. See the glory of the Lord shines upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick clouds cover the peoples. But you upon, upon you the Lord shines, and over you appears his glory. Nations shall walk by your light, and kings by your shining radiance. Raise your eyes and look about. They all gather and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters in the arms of their nurses. Then you shall be radiant at what you see. Your heart shall throb and overflow, for the riches of the sea shall be emptied out before you. 
the wealth of nations shall be brought to you. Caravans of camels shall fill you, dromedaries from Midian and Epah, all from Sheba shall come, bearing gold and frankincense, and proclaiming the praises of the Lord. The word of the Lord. and the isle shall offer gifts. The kings of Arabia and Seba shall bring tribute. All kings shall pay him homage. All nations shall serve him. Lord, every nation on earth will adore you. For he shall rescue the poor when he out, and the afflicted when he has no one to help him. He shall have pity for the lowly and the poor, the lives of the poor he shall save. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, you have heard the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for your benefit, namely, that the mystery is made known to me by revelation. It was not made known to the people in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles and co heirs members of the same body and co-partners in the promise in Jesus Christ through the gospel, the word of the Lord.
Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is the newborn King of the Jews? We saw his star at its rising and have come to do him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was greatly troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. Assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it has been written through the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, you are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, since from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then King Herod called the Magi secretly and ascertained from them the time of the star's appearance. He sent, sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me word, that I too may go and do him homage. After their audience with the king, they set out. And behold, the star that they had seen at its rising preceded them, until it came and stopped over the place where the child was. They were overjoyed at seeing the star. And on entering the house, they saw the child Jesus with Mary, his mother. They prostrated themselves and did Jesus homage. Then they opened their treasures and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their country by another way. The Gospel of the Lord. Today is the Feast of the Epiphany, the manifestation of Jesus to all the world. In our first reading today from the book of Isaiah, as you know, that book was written about 1,500 years after Abraham was sent into the land flowing with milk and honey, the land of promise. What had happened was Abraham and his tribes conquered the Canaanites who were in that land, but then the Canaanites fought back and they for a long time had to live together in a very troubled relationship. And it wasn't until a thousand years after Abraham that King David completely defeated them and established his rule in the Holy Land. But then a lot of difficulties came in and David's followers became very corrupt and a great nation, the Babylonians, came and destroyed the kingdom of Israel and so they finally had to have a dream for their future to keep their faith alive so the prophet Isaiah said one day someday in the future Jerusalem and the nation of Israel will again be the center of the universe and all of the nations of the world will come and worship there and that's the meaning of our first reading and in that reading, we're told that all of these nations will bring gifts to Jerusalem. And the Psalm says the same. There's various gifts along with the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So the notion of the three kings bringing this gold, frankincense, and myrrh to Bethlehem is kind of a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. These three gifts are very important in their symbol 
Gold, of course, is the symbol of for a king. Incense is the symbol of Jesus' divinity because it was always used in worship in the temple. And it was the incense that would take the prayer to the heavens. So the incense was a symbol of Jesus' divinity. And the myrrh was the sign of his humanity because myrrh was used at a funeral and it was an ointment given to the body in preparation for its death and burial. And so the idea was Christ himself was human, he was divine, and he was king of the universe. And so the Ephesians today, in our letter from St. Paul to the Ephesians, says that these three kings represented all the nations of the world coming to bring him homage. Now it's really interesting that Herod plays such an important role in this gospel passage. In the Middle East, in the Near East, uh, outside of the kingdom of Israel, astrologers were very important for discerning what was happening in the world. They were kind of the prophets of the pagan world, so to speak. And so they discerned all of the stars and would find out what their meaning would be. And usually, if there was a certain alignment of the stars, it meant that a very important person had been born into the world and would have a very important role to play. So these astrologers, or these three kings, studied the star of Bethlehem, and they believed that this was the new king of the Jews. So they followed him, probably from Persia, and they followed the star, and then when they arrived to Jerusalem, they asked the present king of the Jews, Herod, if he would help them find the newborn king, the newborn savior. And then we read in the gospel that Herod became frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. It's worthwhile to know a little bit about Herod. His father was an Arab and uh, Herod's father was a very wealthy, influential man in this Palestinian Judean territory. It was uh, populated mostly by the Jewish race, although they had been defeated and were rebuilding themselves, and also all of these various Arab tribes. The whole world really was organized around the tribal life. Even the Jewish people, they had their 12 tribes. So Herod's father was a tribal leader, but the tribal pagans and the Jewish people were constantly fighting. So Herod's father decided that he would become a Jew himself to mollify the Jewish population. And also at that time, Rome was preparing for their invasion of the Judean territories. And so Herod's father aligned himself with the Romans, the eventual winners. And as a reward for that, they set him up as to be the ruler of the Judean territories. Then he died, and his son, Herod, was named the king. That's the king that we read about in the gospel today. So Herod was a Jew, but he was not practicing. Well, he practiced, but he was not a believer. And the idea was to keep the population peaceful and subservient, and that they could then, with the Roman Empire, he worked hand in hand with Pontius Pilate, and, but he was a puppet king for the Romans. However, he was a very powerful man, and he had a great deal of influence. He was living 37 years as king before Jesus was born. For 37 years, the Romans had given him a great army to keep the peace. And not only that, he became a builder. So to help again mollify the Jewish population, he built them the temple. And it was the most magnificent building in all of Judea at that time. As you know, white marble was used to surround the whole building and it would shine in the bright desert sun. So it was the most powerful expression of light that could be seen anywhere in the desert as you approach Jerusalem. And then he also fortified 
all of the walls around the city should it ever come under any attack from anyone trying to go after the Romans, to conquer the Romans. He built uh, an artificial harbor outside of Jerusalem so that trade could take place for the Romans. And not only that, he developed a lot of other large cities in the area, including Caesarea Philippi. So he was known as Herod the Great. He was a builder. And one of the most important things he did was to build an aqueduct to bring fresh water into the city of Jerusalem for the people. So in many ways, they really appreciated Herod and his building campaign over these 37 years. But as he got older, he became more and more paranoid. As he got older, he was very fearful that somebody was going to overthrow him, including members of his own family. There was one point where he thought his wife was plotting against him, so he had her killed. He had six sons. He thought at different times they wanted to take the throne. So he had three of the sons killed. And then he knew that the people were beginning to hate him, and he decided that they may not cry when he came to his natural death. So he ordered that there were going to be a hundred outstanding Jewish citizens that would be brought in to the city at the time of his death, and they would all be murdered together so that the people would cry. He was afraid nobody would weep for him when he died. So he wanted tears at his death. So he decided, well, if we kill all of these outstanding Jewish leaders, then uh, when I die, there'll be tears flowing, even if they're not for me personally. So that was the kind of sick man that he had become. And of course, we hear in the gospel today, he was frightened by this message that a new king of the Jews was coming and might take his throne. And it is right after this that he ordered that all of the children of Bethlehem, two years old and younger, would be slaughtered. He wanted to make sure there was no child that was going to grow up and take the throne of power from him. That was Herod. He lived for about another three years after the birth of Jesus, and the three remaining sons he knew were going to be fighting for the territory. So he, already before he died, he divided up the Judean territory into three areas, and Herod Jr. is the one that took over the Jerusalem area. And he's the one that we meet later on in the gospel when Jesus is brought before Pontius Pilate. So there are two different Herods, the Herod today and Herod Jr. later on. So it's a grim record from Herod the Great. He was Herod the Terror. And rather than think about this terror for our final thought on this Feast of the Epiphany, I'd just like to tell one quick other story about the gift of the Magi. And it's to balance the kind of person Herod was and to look at human beings from another point of view. When I was in high school, I remember we read The Gift of the Magi, and it was written by O. Henry. And it's a beautiful story about a young couple who are very much in love. They're newly married. The young man, the young husband, he only makes $30 a month for his salary. They pay $8 a month for a furnished room. His wife is not working at all because there are no jobs available for her. And she scrapes a little bit of money off of the food budget. And the first Christmas of their married life is coming and they're wondering, what are they going to give each other for a gift? And they really have nothing. So they look at their best gifts that they have, that their best possession. The husband has a silver watch. It had been his great-grandfather's, and it had been handed down generation after generation, and he loved this watch. But it had no chain. Whenever he was in public, he would take the watch out and look at the time so that everyone could see how beautiful his pocket watch was. Meanwhile, his wife, she was very poor. She had no possessions, but she saved $1.87 from her food budget so she could get 
her husband a Christmas gift. And she was a very beautiful young woman. And one of the aspects of her beauty was her long hair. It had never been cut, it went all the way down to her knees. And she would always go out to a beautician shop and she would look in the window at these beautiful combs and brushes that she wished she could use to take care of her hair. And she never had the money to do it. And her husband knew that he was doing this. So Christmas time came, Christmas Eve, she's looking out the window. She says, what am I going to get my husband for a gift? She catches herself in the mirror and decides she's going to have her hair cut. She goes to the beautician, sells her hair for $20, she still has that $1.87, and she finds, shopping around, for $21, she can buy a silver chain for her husband's pocket watch. Meantime, he's wondering what he's gonna get his wife. He has no money, and he knows how much he loves those combs and brushes. So he sells his pocket watch, and with the money from that, he buys the combs and brushes. So there, his wife is, has the meal ready, he comes in from work, and he sees her hair is all cut, and he can't believe it. And she was afraid that he loved her only for her hair. And she started crying, and she, she said, you don't love me anymore. And he said, no, 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 it's not your hair, I love you. And then he told her what he did. He sold his pocket watch to buy her these beautiful combs and brushes. And then she started realizing, or gave him the gift, of his chain for his pocket watch, which he no longer had. So the gifts now were useless. But the most precious gift of all, and that's why the author calls it the gift of the Magi, is the sacrificial love that each one knows the other has for them. It's this beautiful exchange of love that captures their first married love. And it's called the gift of the Magi. So today, on this feast of the Epiphany, we might think, what gifts do we bring to the king? Maybe after mass, you take a moment and see this beautiful Christmas manger, the three kings offering their gold, their frankincense, and their myrrh. King Herod, he had nothing to offer but his own self-centered living, which became very violent because of protecting his greed. All he had to give was himself, and he was a mess. He was more than a mess, he was a terror. He was probably somebody that we would not want to have for a neighbor. But these young people, they gave the gift of themselves, their most precious gifts. They're the people we would want for a neighbor. Maybe they're the people we would like to be ourselves. So we could look at this Christmas crib and ask ourselves, what gifts do I have to bring to this newborn king of the world? What is in my heart that I can give to this king? What is in my heart more than gold, frankincense, and myrrh that I can give to my family, to my neighbor, to our world? as the most precious gift that is in my heart. Let us profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. My sisters and brothers, today we celebrate the epiphany, the boundless love that God has revealed to all people in the form of Jesus, our Messiah. In that spirit, we humbly bring before God prayers for the needs of the whole world. For the church around the world, that newcomers and visitors may always feel welcomed and valued, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For greater trust, that like the wise men, God's light may guide us into the uncharted future, and that we may follow trusting in God's love and care for us. We pray, for the, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who are seekers, for those who are confused, for those who desire commitment, and for those who wish to begin again, that God will lead them to a new beginning filled with meaning and purpose. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Direct the church in Vermont during this time of preparation for the diocesan synod. Help us to discern the signs of the time wisely, that we may joyfully proclaim the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all recovering from fires, cold weather, or blizzards, that God will guide them through the challenges that they may face. Renew their spirits and open their hearts of open the hearts of many to assist and encourage them. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have died, especially James Horrigan, Caroline Eddington, and Ethel Schelk. May they experience the fullness of joy with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for all eternity. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the prayers we hold in our hearts, united through the intercession of Mary, the Mother of God. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray too for our confirmation class this year. We pray to the Lord. And let us pray for all of those who are suffering in this frigid weather. We pray to the Lord. Dear God, you are the Lord of light. Today you have revealed yourself to the whole world through your son Jesus. We ask that you hear the prayers that we make and grant them in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Our second collection today will be taken up for our parish school. Thank you for your generosity. The offertory hymn is We Three Kings. Number 108. Traverse of fire. 
sisters and brothers, let us pray that this, your sacrifice and mine, may be acceptable to our Almighty Father. Amen. Look with favor, Lord, we pray, on these gifts of your church, to which are offered, in which are offered now, not gold or frankincense or myrrh, but he who by them is proclaimed, sacrificed and received, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just 
our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty, eternal God. For today you have revealed the mystery of our salvation in Christ as a light for all the nations. And when he appeared in our mortal nature, you made us new by the glory of his immortal nature. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and the powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. You are to be glorified, O God, for you love us. You always walk with us on our journey of life. Blessed indeed is your Son Jesus present in our midst as we are gathered by his love. And when is once for the disciples, so now for us, he opens the scriptures and breaks the bread. Therefore, Father most merciful, we ask you, send forth your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and wine that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord, Jesus Christ. For on the day before he was to suffer, on the night of the Last Supper, he took bread and said the blessing. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving you thanks, he gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. Father, as we celebrate the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Savior, whom you led through his passion and death on the cross to the glory of the resurrection, and whom you have seated at your right hand. We, your people, proclaim the work of your love until he comes again. We offer you the bread of life and the chalice of blessing. Father, look with favor on this oblation of your church in which we show forth the paschal sacrifice of Christ that has been handed on to us. And grant that by the power of the spirit of your love, we may be counted now and until the day of eternity among the members of your Son in whose body and blood we have communion. By our partaking of this mystery, Almighty Father, Give us life through your Spirit. 
Grant that we may be conformed to the image of Jesus. Confirm us in the bond of communion together with Francis our Pope, Christopher our Bishop, all other bishops, priests, deacons, with our parish community and with your entire people. Merciful God, grant that all the faithful of the church, looking into the signs of our secular time by the light of faith, may constantly devote ourselves to the service of the gospel. Keep us attentive to the needs of all people, so that in sharing their grief and pain, their joy and their hope, we may faithfully bring them the good news of salvation and go forward with them along the way of your kingdom. Father, remember our sisters and brothers who have fallen asleep in the peace of your Christ. Remember all of the dead whose faith you alone have known. Admit them to rejoice in the light of your face. In the resurrection, give them the fullness of life. Grant also to us, when our earthly pilgrimage is done, that we too may come to an eternal dwelling place and live with you forever in communion with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Joseph, her spouse, the apostles, the martyrs, and all of the saints, where we shall praise you and exalt you through Jesus Christ, your Son. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to pray. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our day, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus, you said to your friends, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on our faith, 
and graciously grant us peace and unity in accordance with your will, you who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of our newborn Savior be with all of you. Let us share with one another a sign of Christ's peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are we called to the supper of the Lamb. May the body and blood of Jesus keep us safe to eternal life. seen his star in the east and have come with gifts to adore the Lord. 